Hello again. It feels like a long time since I've seen our church family. How are you doing with the whole social isolation? That's a phrase no one had heard of only a few weeks ago, and, and now that's all you hear on the news and from the authorities. So how are you holding up? You getting a, a lot of family time, like it or not? Hopefully you like it. Might be getting a little cabin fever, like Pastor Daniel mentioned uh, last weekend. The good news is that the weather is slowly warming up, so uh, you can send the kids outside. The older folks may be having a tough time with the social isolation because you don't get to see the grandkids, except maybe a video chat or through the window. I think so far, people here are fairly understanding of following government guidelines, staying at home and, and social distancing. But I wonder what will happen if this lasts for months instead of weeks. How will that affect us mentally, emotionally, and of course spiritually? Maybe you have found yourself praying like me, God, how much longer? When are you going to help us to come up with a cure? Why are you doing this to us? What's the point? Has anyone else thought that or prayed that? Okay, I'm not the only one. I think this prayer may be an indication of a fundamental Christian principle that I'm wrestling with, and maybe you are too, trusting God when you don't understand. In our lifetime, we have never experienced anything like this. The threat to our health, the financial strain on the globe, and the loss of many social freedoms. I don't have to explain that in detail because we're living it, and just the fact that we're not supposed to meet together here and worship in our building it says something about that, that we've never seen this in our lifetime. So what is God doing? And more importantly, why is he doing this? That's not a unique question. Many people have asked it at some point in life. And maybe you have gone through something in your life that has made you ask God, why are you doing this to me? I want to look at a Bible story where those involved likely asked the same question. They too struggled with the fundamental Christian principle of trusting God when you don't understand. That phrase is a subtitle of a book that uh, has been very helpful for me in preparing today uh, called Why, written by Billy Graham's daughter Anne Graham Lotz. Uh, a great book if you uh, struggle with this question of why. One reason we tend to struggle with the principle of trusting God when we don't understand is we have this subconscious idea if God really does love me, and I am pleasing Him, He will make my life relatively easy. He should make me happy. That sounds fair to me, but at its core, it's selfishness. It's a relationship based on obligation and manipulation. God, if I do this for you, then you need to do this for me. Even though God loves everyone, the reality is, bad things happen even to those who do please Him. Can we still trust him even when we don't understand what he's doing? There's a Bible story along those lines. So if you have a Bible, uh, I hope it's with you. If not, put me on pause and go get it. I want to look at a verse or a chapter, chapter 11 in the book of John. And John is found in uh, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 11 is a story about three siblings, a brother and two sisters. So let's read part of that story from John chapter 11. I'll be reading uh, verses 1 to 3. And it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, if we were to follow this through, if we were to follow, I should say, the life of Jesus during his, his three years on earth, we would see that he liked to hang out in the village of Bethany, and in particular at the home of Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. It was like his second home. But now Lazarus is sick, and it doesn't look good. And so his sisters call 911. In biblical times, that meant sending an urgent message to Jesus Lord, the one you love is sick. 
This wasn't an FYI, uh, by the way, Jesus, uh, just letting you know Lazarus isn't doing so well. No, this was a call for help. They wouldn't call Jesus if they didn't think he could help. So there's an expectation. We don't know what's wrong with Lazarus, and we've tried everything, and he's getting worse. We need you to come and heal him. This cry for help is what we do when we pray. Prayer is a reminder that we are not in control. We need help outside of ourselves. Have you ever prayed a 911 type prayer? Like, God, I'm desperate. I need you. I don't know where to turn. Please show up. There's nothing wrong with asking and even begging God to intervene in a hopeless situation. There's nothing wrong with asking God to take COVID-19 away or help the researchers to find a vaccine. I think we need to ask. He wants us to ask. And again, prayer is a reminder that we are not in control. But what, but what happens when he doesn't answer the way we expect? And we wonder if God is actually listening. And if he is listening and not doing anything about it, we may even wonder if he really loves us. In her book, Why, that I just mentioned, Anne Graham Lotz asks, Are you interpreting his love by your circumstances instead of interpreting your circumstances by his love? Your present circumstances don't determine whether or not God loves you. The Bible says plainly, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for us, taking the punishment of our sin. There's no greater way he could show us his love. And now all we need to do is commit to following Jesus and we can experience God's forgiveness to our, for our sins. We can experience a peace and an understanding. We can experience the strength with this wonderful relationship we can have with him on this earth. And if you want to know more about this, send me a note through our church website, gracech.ca. Very simple. In our story, we read more than once that Jesus loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, but Jesus doesn't respond the way we want. And we see what happens. Let me read another passage for you from, uh, from John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days, and then says to, said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. So instead of uh, hurrying back to help Lazarus, like his sisters expected, Jesus deliberately waits a couple of more days. And yet, verse 5 says that Jesus loved them. If Jesus loved them, why didn't he go exactly when they asked? Why didn't he go right away? Did he get distracted? Was he too busy? Was he incapable of helping? No. He deliberately delayed his return. And in the meantime, Lazarus' condition worsened. Have you ever prayed something and then the situation actually got worse instead of better? You prayed for your son or daughter to come back to the Lord, but instead he or she became hostile to any mention of God. You prayed that work would get busier, but instead you got laid off. I have a couple of friends who are both struggling in their marriages. They begged God to heal their marriage. And in both cases, their spouse eventually filed for divorce. And that's confusing. Why doesn't God do what we ask? Doesn't he want marriages to survive? Well, of course. But he loves us so much, he won't force his will on people. He allows people to choose their own path in life with or without him. Sometimes God is silent because he brings us to the point of hopelessness or helplessness. Does that sound cruel? Does that sound like uh, maybe he's making things worse instead of better? Now, why wouldn't God allow us, for example, to get rid of this COVID-19? It's a question that I have asked myself as well. 
In my lifetime, I can think of at least two other stories that have grabbed the world's attention. The terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the acts of the Islamic terrorists in the U.S. that took almost 3,000 lives, and closer to home, the Humboldt Broncos bus crash where 16 people died. In April 6, it'll be two years. Hard to believe it's been two years. And in both of those tragedies, I remember hearing a lot about prayer in the media and news outlets. Pray for the victims or pray for the families of the victims. Uh, prayers for Humboldt and maybe you have a bumper sticker like that. At times of such tragedy, yes, we need to be praying for those affected. And in relation to COVID-19, to this point, I haven't heard anything in the media about prayer. Certainly not asking God to help us through this or asking God to find a cure. And perhaps God is waiting for people to come to a point of hopelessness and helplessness for the world to admit their need for God to intervene. In the case of my friends whose marriages were in trouble, it definitely brought them to a point of hopelessness and helplessness. And I know it has brought them closer to God, even though their marriage situation actually got worse. God can use our pain, He can use our suffering and heartache to fulfill His greater plan. It may be a plan that we may not understand, but He can use it as an opportunity to draw us closer to Him. Now in our story, Jesus said in verse 4, Lazarus' situation will glorify God. Jesus knew God would be glorified more if he let Lazarus die than if he healed him from his sickness. God's silence does not mean he's absent. Now let's continue in our story. We'll read verse 30 and verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now, do you notice, did you notice that the writer makes sure to tell us that this detail that may seem insignificant to most people, but actually to the people at that time, it was quite significant. And it was this belief that among some of the first century people that a soul hovered over a dead body for three days, hoping to re-enter it. But after three days, the soul would leave. So perhaps Jesus deliberately waited more than three days so that all hope was gone from those who believed this superstition. And you can sense the grief and maybe even anger in Martha's tone if you'd only been here, Lazarus would not have died. Where were you? What took you so long? In another Bible story about Martha from the book of Luke, Martha seemed too busy to take time for Jesus. But here, she undoubtedly is a woman of faith. And Jesus tells her directly, Your brother will rise again. Even though she's heartbroken at the death of her brother, she is convinced that that she will see Lazarus again in the resurrection at the end time. Isn't it wonderful to have that reassurance from Jesus? That promise of a, of a resurrection and a reunion with all those who were followers of Jesus before they died. We have the same hope and faith that Martha had. There can be a joyful hope even in the midst of grief. Martha's joyful hope would be realized much sooner than she expected. She actually misunderstood Jesus' promise. She thought it was only for the end of time, and soon we'll find out what Jesus meant. But right now, all Martha can see is her grief at the loss of her brother, which in her mind wouldn't have happened if Jesus had come when he was supposed to. She feels hurt. She feels disappointed by Jesus. 
yet her faith was not wavered. And we see that in, in verse 27. I believe, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Martha is a beautiful example of someone who trusted in God even when she didn't understand. Earlier I mentioned the terrorist attacks of 9-11. One of the planes that was hijacked by the terrorists was believed to be headed toward a target in Washington, D.C. Several passengers overpowered the suicide bombers or the, the, the hijackers who were uh, trying to commit suicide and they, the plane then crashed into a field in Pennsylvania and all of the people on board were killed. One of those passengers was Todd Beamer. His wife, Lisa Beamer, was interviewed by the Decision Magazine a year after the attacks. And when she was asked about her husband, she told the interviewer, God says, I knew on September 10th, and I could have stopped it, but I have a plan for greater good than you can ever imagine. And then Lisa Beamer says, I don't know God's plan, and honestly, right now, I don't like it very much but I trust that he is true to his promise in Romans 8, 28. What an amazing modern day example of trusting God when you don't understand why he didn't step in and change the outcome. When God does step in, it's according to his timing and he's never too late. The kind of trust this widow has doesn't come easy. It comes over time, through suffering, desperation, and even hopelessness. Martha goes back to her house and she she tells her sister that Jesus has arrived and her and he wants to talk to her and so uh, she goes quickly to see Jesus and she literally falls at his feet and says the exact same thing that Martha said Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died. Now note Jesus reaction to suffering in this story. He is deeply moved, his, he is uh, troubled in spirit, and it says that he wept. Now Jesus is not oblivious to human suffering. I mean he gets it. He hurts when we hurt. Now let me read, let me read part of that passage again. And uh, this is actually from Verse 33, so when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came along with her also weeping, he was deeply troubled and moved in his spirit, and he asked, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. When the Jews, uh, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And so we can see that Jesus hurts when we hurt. He was deeply moved. He was troubled in his spirit, and he wept. He hurts when we hurt. He gets it. Some Bible translations, they indicate that Jesus was angry. It makes Jesus angry to see what has happened to the world as a result of sin. When God created this world, sickness and death, marriage breakups, COVID-19, all of the things that caused pain and suffering and heartache were not part of his original plan. They are the result of sin, which originated way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. This imperfect world was not part of God's original plan. I've heard people question if this pandemic is God's punishment against the world for their sin. I thought Jesus already paid the punishment for our sin when he died on the cross. Wasn't that good enough? Now God has to send a virus too? Plus there have been many, many pandemics in this world, long before coronavirus and much deadlier ones too. I know it's true that only God knows how many victims this virus will take and so far the last count I looked it was over 60,000 lives and that is too many, don't get me wrong. But the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 affected an estimated half a billion people worldwide and killed as many as 50 million people. A flu pandemic that started in 1957 killed around 2 million people worldwide. Another pandemic that started in 1968 killed approximately 1 million people. And not long ago in 2009, the H1N1 flu killed by some estimates over a half a million people. 
And these are just pandemics in the last hundred years. Is every pandemic God's judgment against sin? Or is a pandemic the result of the fall of man? I'm going with the last one. So to those who say this is the beginning of the end of time, I agree. We, we are one day closer to the end times today than we were yesterday. Someone has put it this way. The world is falling apart. Sorry, the world is not falling apart. It's falling into place. Yeah, God is not unaware of this pandemic. He is very much aware of, of what you and I are going through. And it affects him deeply. So let's continue. Let's, uh, let's finish our story. And let's read the final part of that story. In uh, Let's start at verse 38 and read till the end of the story. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord Martha, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Then Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. And just to think that Mary and Martha were disappointed Jesus was too late to heal Lazarus from his illness. Look what they would have missed. A resurrection instead of a healing. God exceeded their expectations. Are you willing to trust God when you don't understand what he's doing? Perhaps he wants to exceed your expectations. You think you have found the one, your partner for life, and then suddenly he or she ends it. Perhaps the Lord has someone better suited for you. You get laid off from your job. Isn't it at least possible that the Lord has something else for you? Maybe something better? As I was preparing for today, I, I couldn't help but wonder, why is God letting this craziness go on? Like, when will there be an end to this? Recently, I, I watched an interview with a guy who used to be in a Navy SEAL. And the Navy SEALs is an elite uh, force within the U.S. Navy. Navy SEAL training, as I understand it, is 32 weeks long, and only 20% of those who start will finish because it's so hard. Around week four, there's a 136 hours straight, intense period of training with maybe two hours of sleep. It's called Hell, Hell Week for a reason. From Sunday evening to Friday afternoon, they run in the soft sand, they swim in the cold ocean, they carry heavy objects over insanely long distances, and on and on it goes. And the guy being interviewed was now an instructor at Hell Week, and he said the point of Hell Week is not to test how tough they are physically. He said something like, we test the strength of their mind through their body, how tough they are mentally. And it made me think of our world today. Maybe God is testing the spiritual strength of the Christian church through the coronavirus. Are we going to trust God even when we have so many unanswered questions? When will life get back to normal? Will I lose my job? How many more will die? Will I get infected? Remember the, the two women in our story, Mary and Martha. In agony, they watched their brother die. Broken hearted, they buried him in the tomb. How could Jesus let this happen? And yet we know the end of the story. Jesus allowed Lazarus to die in order to glorify God when he brought Lazarus back to life. We don't know where this COVID-19 story ends. And we struggle, I should say, if you struggle to trust God when you don't understand, let's keep in mind, if God is silent, it doesn't mean he's absent. Also, 
God is never too late. Jesus feels our pain. And God may exceed our expectations. There are many people who died during Jesus' time here on earth. Why did Jesus choose to raise Lazarus from the dead and not some others? If Lazarus' sisters hadn't called out to Jesus for help, I don't think he would have come. They asked. The equivalent today is prayer. Now we live in a world that is full of fear and anxiety and, and uncertainty. Much of life has been interrupted and disrupted. In some cases, people are suffering and dying from COVID-19. So as a body of believers, I want to encourage you to fast and to pray this week. Skip a meal or two or fast for a few days. And instead of eating, let's expose our heart before the Lord and let's lift up those who are having a hard time dealing with this new reality. Those who are suffering, particularly in the hardest hit regions. Let's begin to bring COVID-19 and ask God, let's bring it, ask him to bring it to an end. He may exceed our expectations. And in the meantime, let's continue to trust God even when we don't understand what he's doing. Let me pray with you. Let's pray together. <laughs> Father, we thank you that you love us, you care for us. You have showed your love when you sent Jesus, your son, to die on the cross and take the punishment for our sins. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the promise that we read in the story of a, a future resurrection. And Lord, we ask that you would bring comfort, you would bring pre peace to those who are struggling with anxiety. Lord, we also ask that you would allow the researchers who are looking for a vaccine, that they would, they would find a vaccine to COVID-19 and that they would bring it to an end. Father, we also ask that you would heal those who are infected and you would protect those who are caregivers. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us, you would give us patience, and Lord, that you would give us an opportunity to show your love and your comfort to someone. Amen. It sure has been good to spend time with you. Next week is Easter weekend, and we had all sorts of special plans to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. And many of those plans we'll have to put on hold until we can meet again. So remember, in the meantime, remember our God is so much greater than COVID-19. And we will close with one of my favorite songs, Jesus, I Need You. I hope you'll sing along. Bye for now.